So I am the aforementioned Willard Larkin, <coughs> and uh, this is the Sensory Systems Program. Uh, <coughs> the uh, portfolio has uh, three sub areas, <coughs> which are probably best uh, described on, on the next slide in more detail. <coughs> uh, so I'll just move on to it. Uh, <coughs> The uh, percentages here represent approximately how much uh, of the total core funding goes to these. So you see that there are two larger areas, top and bottom, one smaller area in terms of funding, but not necessarily in terms of impact. The uh, advanced auditory modeling for acoustic analysis is the full title of that top one. And the idea here is to uh, <coughs> try to figure out how the auditory brain uh, analyzes acoustic landscapes, ac acoustic ins inputs, and binds them and adapts to uh, the situations such as uh, reverberation and so on. <coughs> and uh, we want to try to emulate as much as possible the areas in which human auditory or mammalian auditory function uh, ex exceeds uh, machine listening devices. And there are some important areas in which that is a problem, a, an enormous problem. Although this area uh, is uh, maybe dates from Alexander Graham Bell, <laughs> um, and so you could say this is a, a mature area. Um, on the other hand, there are some enormously challenging problems that are unsolved and of, of very much uh, interest and importance for the Air Force. Uh, for example, one of them would be to uh, figure out finally how to actually, uh, in real time, um, um, uh, enable uh, uh, speech to be more intelligible than it would otherwise be. Uh, speech enhancement, as it's sometimes called. The, uh, the problem, uh, as it's been uh, discussed over decades uh, has not been solved, although last year I did announce uh, what seems to be a breakthrough in this area. Most of these attempts to, to enhance the intelligibility of speech amount to uh, changing or boosting the signal to noise ratio of the speech over its background, and uh, this uh, often ends up uh, with a deterior, deterior, deterioration of, of the speech in terms of our ability to understand it. <coughs> anyway, um, because I covered that particular breakthrough last year, I probably won't mention it more. Um, the Polarization Vision and Optics program is uh, the only federal program on this topic, uh, uh, targeting biological systems <coughs> And it's full of discoveries. Uh, I will remind you probably of one of these, one or two of these discoveries as we go through. Um, and the idea is, can we, um, can these unique bio-optical systems be emulated in uh, optical engineering? <coughs> uh, the sensory motor control of flight and navigation area uh, is the largest area right now, and. Um, it's, the arrow goes up on it because, um, partly because of the AFOSR bio-navigation initiative that uh, uh, came my way in terms of funds uh, this year. The uh, strategy at the bottom for all of these is as much as possible to forge useful connections between math and biology to get uh, people working across disciplines on these things. Now I have a few snapshots uh, to show of uh, various sundry aspects of the program before I get to uh, research examples. Uh, this is one that's kind of interesting. I just realized this recently that we've had these workshops that I haven't had much to do with having to propel, propel into existence because my PIs uh, self-organize <coughs> and uh, so here are some. There was another one last month, uh, too late for these slides. 
Uh, so uh, it, it shows that we have a community that of people who know each other, and uh, and they invite others as well, of course. <coughs> and uh, so it's it's uh, it's a great advantage to be a program manager in a system like this, where uh, where the scientists are um, are active in this way. These are some of my primary coordinations. It's just a, a quick view of this. Uh, I got started making this chart, and then I realized, well, I can't list everybody and everything. But uh, there are three uh, AFRL TDs, the Information Directorate, the Human Effectiveness Directorate, and the Munitions and Guidance Directorate. And um, <coughs> Tom McKenna is here. Thank you, Tom, for attending from ONR. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, this doesn't uh, show all of the coordination that goes on, but gives us uh, some of the names. Now, uh, here are some interesting developments with the people in my program. On the left is Dr. Jennifer Talley. She's a biologist. She was working at Case Western University in uh, our grant sponsor uh, that we sponsored there. And now she's transitioned and uh, down to Eglin Air Force Base to uh, be part of the AFRL. And also on the right, Dr. Eric Thompson, whose field is acoustics, similarly was sponsored as a postdoc at Boston University, and now he's joined our, our lab group uh, down at Wright Pat. In the middle, uh, Dr. Uh, Varsney, some of you know him. Uh, we uh, uh, funded his work on, a, on what I thought was going to be a very, very difficult problem uh, uh, on sto stochastic resonance. And I uh, formulated it a few years ago as, you know, find some theorems that are, uh, <coughs> that tell you what the optimal noise to put into a nonlinear system should be in order to optimize the resonance effect. And he actually, or his Chinese postdoc, <laughs> uh, solved that problem. And largely for that reason, I think he's got this IEEE Resnick Metal now, which is a, a wonderful thing to report to you. Uh, here are a couple of other uh, uh, highlights. Uh, on the left, this, uh, I don't have the name of the person who did this work on the OPSIN map. That was Megan Porter. She's at the uh, <coughs> Uni uh, University of Maryland Baltimore campus. And uh, she did a genomic analysis. Uh, OPSINs are the proteins that produce the uh, visual photoreceptor pigments, like rhodopsin, for example. But uh, there are some 900 or 1,000 of them to be accounted for in evolutionary history. And so she has worked out this phyl phylogenetic map for them. And this is extremely interesting to us because it tells us where to look, let's say, for polarization receptor uh, phenomena in other animals. <coughs> and a lot of these, of course, a lot of these receptors, photoreceptors, are not involved in forming any visual images whatsoever. Uh, uh, most of them aren't. And uh, that's, uh, they might be involved in, for example, uh, <coughs> the change uh, that the s uh, surface of an animal undergoes in order to camouflage itself. That's a topic that Hugh DeLong is likely to tell you something about when it becomes his turn. Um, <coughs> in the middle is this volume. Uh, it's the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, biology, I guess, New Directions in Biological Research on Polarized Light. It's an entire issue that um, is devoted to our program. So I'm very proud of this. Um, and on the, on the right, some of you may remember Dr. Kiedis Mukes. He was the uh, uh, director of what was then the Life Sciences Directorate uh, here at AFOSR. Um, <coughs> this uh, inter international symposium, he was the keynote speaker on it. And so that's why I put this up there so you can see his picture. <coughs> Actually, my, my uh, colleague Jay Myung's program is the one that found, uh, funded this, but uh, I took the money out of his program before he got here. <laughs> 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 the, uh, 
th there are many different kinds of transitions um, to, uh, to report, and I'm not going to belabor uh, these at all, but just to show you that uh, they go in lots of different in interesting directions. Uh, <coughs> this one uh, to the Bloedel Hearing Institute uh, is worked by Les Atlas at the University of Washington, and his, his name will come up later because of his work on uh, <coughs> coherent uh, modulation, filtering, and representation. And that's the method that uh, turned out to improve auditory coding in cochlear implants. And uh, so this is a, a wonderful uh, uh, outcome. And we, of course, we can't directly fund uh, and direct projects at biomedical problems. But once in a while, we get something like this that works out. Um, so, um, well, I think I'll just uh, leave that chart and go to this. Here's, here's an example of a <coughs> transition to the Army MAST program. MAST stands for Micro Autonomous Systems and Technology. And there's a website to it if you want at the bottom of the screen. Um, so here is an example of uh, how, how our funding got coupled with uh, uh, some SIVRs and some 6-2 funding, uh, starting with insect compound eye research um, <coughs> that uh, Rick Whaling's group uh, engaged in early on, <coughs> and then some work in Australia at University of Adelaide <coughs> by David O'Carroll, and then some modeling work of that <coughs> by Pat Shoemaker. <coughs> Uh, and so on, and then finally insect flight behavior modeling. And so here we have this quad rotor that uh, <coughs> can find its way around obstacles. This is a, kind of a schematic or simulation of it, I think. But I've seen this work in, in, in environments with all sorts of impediments. <coughs> so it, impl it implements autonomous three-dimensional three navigation, <coughs> and it uses it entirely uh, uh, wild, uh, <laughs> yeah, wild, wide field of view, <coughs> optic flow to accomplish that. And finally, maybe uh, uh, as an example of a transition, <coughs> this is a sequence of, first of all, of discovery, <coughs> where, uh, as you've seen, those of you who have seen the pri prior spring reviews, I pointed out that our, our scientists uh, uh, discovered the very first uh, circular polarization receptor. It, it detects and discriminates left versus right polarization. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, it uses <coughs> a, uh, an achromatic phase delay membrane. <coughs> it's achromatic from about 300 to 700 nanometers. There's a picture of that, <coughs> and one of our uh, PIs at U University of Bristol <coughs> figured out how it worked, uh, modeled it uh, uh, optically. <coughs> it depends on uh, this balance of <coughs> birefringence properties <coughs> of the microvilli elements <coughs> and uh, in balance with form birefringence. So it produces an invariant phase delay. So uh, after that was announced in this Nature Photonics <coughs> uh, paper as Nature's perfect wave plate, <coughs> that's what it says in, on the cover here, <coughs> um, various labs have worked on trying to emulate it. And I think this is the first, first one. There have been some, uh, several uh, other labs have tried other, other m methods since. <coughs> but this. <coughs> This is a deposition of uh, tantalum O5 nanorad, nanorod layers, and they're about 174 nanometers up and down. And some of, some of them are tilted, and some of them are not. Or, and uh, so uh, you get this birefringence property. X is horizontal, uh, <coughs> and Y is some d dimension uh, orthogonal to that, I think, coming out of the screen. <coughs> and. Uh, and so all four Stokes parameters remain nearly constant in this multi-layered structure. It turns out to be 
uh, nearly uh, transparent, <coughs> and uh, its behavior as a, as a phase delay device uh, apparently doesn't matter uh, what the angle of incidence is. So it's a little success story for <coughs> making a, uh, uh, a device out of nanorods that emulates the behavior found in the biology. <coughs> now, now I'm going to concentrate on the, for a few minutes, on the uh, auditory modeling for acoustic analysis portion of my portfolio. And uh, as I've said earlier, uh, there are some enormous problems that remain. <coughs> um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I've, <coughs> I've mentioned Dr. DeLang Wang at Ohio State. He's, a, he's the last one on the left, uh, who is an expert in computational auditory scene analysis. He's the one that I, I've um, highlighted last year, I think, <coughs> for a, a nice potential, I think it's a real uh, breakthrough in enhancing speech intelligibility. Um, so I can't uh, tell you about every one of these, but I, I do want to tell you a, a, about a few technical advances that have accrued in the last year. <coughs> and this first one from Boston University is a, uh, is a result of the <coughs> problem uh, described over here on the left-hand side <coughs> that listeners can hear what listeners can hear in real multi-source acoustic environments. And this, and this means everything beyond uh, headphones and so on. <coughs> Uh, is ter turns out to be more constrained by informational masking than by direct energet energetic interference of one sound by another. This, is, uh, this has been kind of slow to be recognized, but it was recognized by our folks down at Wright Pat in the uh, bioacoustics group rather early, and so they've been working with Jerry Kidd at Boston University ever since. And so what we've, what's been needed is some way to isolate the effects of informational masking from those of, in, of energetic masking. And uh, <coughs> so that's what it says here, AFOSR seeks techniques to study and suppress informational masking. So uh, <coughs> Dr. Kidd came up with this very interesting pointillistic uh, way of coding speech. I think there are, six in this example, there are 16 frequency channels going left to right, <coughs> and then there are uh, 10 millisecond time uh, slices taken vertically. <coughs> so each uh, little time frequency uh, pixel of uh, speech <coughs> has been replaced with a matching cosine fragment. And then what, what's so, so amazing about this is if you listen to this, it sounds like speech. It doesn't sound like a lot of funny coded noise. And uh, <coughs> so um, this provides a, a, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, <coughs> to get rid of the energetic overlap between sounds, between multiple speech sounds, which is uh, Jerry Kidd's uh, main interest, and to isolate the energetic uh, and, and uh, to isolate the informational effects that prevent uh, pre prevent us from <coughs> understanding one person's speech while other people are talking, for example. <coughs> uh, here's another recent advance. The reviewer, <coughs> to one of the reviewers for this one said, uh, this is the, uh, the best uh, uh, technical uh, advance I've seen in many decades for the problem of figuring out how binaural hearing uh, works in sound localization. So this is a brand new uh, start, and I don't have uh, <coughs> very many results from this to uh, show you. I don't have any, in fact. <coughs> it just started. But uh, what it depends on <coughs> is the ability to measure very, very precisely, and then to reproduce <coughs> at the two ears uh, what uh, is the sound wave. And, and the, the problem is most methods of doing this <coughs> in, encounter interaural crosstalk 
between one ear, ear and another. And <clears throat> but you want to be able to do this without clamping headphones on and having somebody, but just have somebody in a, in a normal room environment or any environment. <clears throat> so what uh, Bill Hartman has, has, has done, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> this, this was uh, highlighted in, the, I saw it in Physics Today, one of the issues, <clears throat> is an ability to uh, uh, record with great precision <coughs> what the independent uh, waveforms are at the two ears <coughs> without having to worry about the placement of the probe, probe microphones. And this this uh, upper graph shows you the conventional method where it uh, depends a lot on what the probe microphones are, where they are exactly. <coughs> so. <coughs> We, we are looking forward to uh, a lot of good, new, precise results from this. <coughs> now here's a, uh, a development that stems out of uh, Dr. Les Atlas's work at University of Washington. <coughs> His student, Brian King, worked as a summer student down at uh, wright Pat <coughs> in the Human Effectiveness Directorate. <coughs> and he worked on this uh, problem of recovering how do you recover multiple speech signals from a single channel? <coughs> and uh, so here's a diagram that sh shows why the phase of those two signals, A and B, matters. And that's pretty obvious to ev everyone here <coughs> that if you just crunch them together and mix sources, you're going to uh, get a, a distorted, <coughs> uh, insufficient uh, separation. So Brian King. Uh, worked out this new matrix factorization method which solves the superposition and the phase problems and it eliminates also ad hoc basis selection for doing this. So here, here's a little chart that shows the recognition scores have gone up as a result hey, uh, you, of this if technique. You move your mic up a little higher there, uh, not hearing it well in the back. Move my mic up higher. Okay, maybe. I have to be able to see my microphone to do this. Can, can you see this? There we go. All right. Ooh. <laughs> so, so this is a this is a uh, technical advance that uh, we're we're quite proud of, and here's another one, <coughs> which. Um, has been worked out by our two uh, investigators <coughs> down at Wright Pat in the Human Effectiveness Directorate, Anandini Iyer and Brian Simpson, our co PIs on this one. <coughs> and uh, they've asked a, uh, they've been asking uh, a, a lot of interesting questions that about uh, how listeners sort out overlapping speech. This one uh, illustrated here represents a very old problem, <coughs> but it has a very surprising uh, uh, result. Uh, the scientific question is, <coughs> if each of your two ears, left and right, receives a distinct speech message, can the auditory brain extract key information, that is meaning, from both? Now, of course, you can hear both. That's, that's not the question. Of course, you can hear what's in your left ear and what's in your right ear, <coughs> but can you get the meaning out of it? On this chart, uh, the signal to noise ratio of a single word, a, key, a keyword is, is plotted, <coughs> the level of noise masking a keyword, <coughs> and um, <coughs> uh, it's, it's inverse so that uh, the signal to noise ratio increases to the right. And, and so if, a, if, if you hear a, a preamble phrase of some sort, let's say, um, the dog chewed on the, and uh, you hear that perfectly clearly, <coughs> and then what it chewed on is masked by a, a, a noise, and it's hard to hear the noise, <coughs> hard, hard to hear the word through the noise. If, if the pre preamble phrase is something else, let's say um, they talked about a, that doesn't give you quite the same kind of advantage as to uh, hearing out the keyword. So in one case, you might get high performance, in another case, 
low performance. But then <clears throat> suppose you put uh, two different, entirely different, but completely audible uh, preamble phrases, one in the left, one in the right, <clears throat> and then at random the keyword appears in one side or the other. That turns out through a very tight logic to uh, predict <coughs> this curve, the blue curve is the prediction for that case, and it strongly supports a model in which the, uh, <coughs> the, the brain has to uh, switch attention between the left and the right and is unable to divide the attention between the two of them. <coughs> so I, I think I was amazed when I saw this especially because I know about the history of work on this problem. It dates way back. Uh, previous experimenters had tried to uh, solve this problem by trying to manipulate the listener's attention span or the, the focus of the listener's attention. And the results were never clear cut. But uh, <coughs> Brian Simpson and Nand Nandini Iyer have uh, have a nice uh, result here. It'll be in the Journal of the Acu Acoustical Society pretty soon. <coughs> and now back to Dr. Les Atlas and his uh, coherent modulation analysis. <coughs> Here's another uh, very unexpected uh, <coughs> uh, transition well, and from his work, and I'm just going to show you what it is without going into much detail here. Uh, it works out that his analysis of the acoustics of hole drilling machinery <coughs> uh, with a simple one microphone setup <coughs> can uh, chart the quality of the hole that's being drilled. <coughs> and uh, so the Boeing company has uh, liked this very much. <coughs> but that's, uh, that's, I believe, the last slide I have on this uh, section of my program involving um, <coughs> auditory modeling or acoustic analysis. And I want to turn now to the sensory motor control of natural flight and navigation, <coughs> where here the fundamental question we're asking is <coughs> what kinds of uh, underlying principles drive the design, I uh, use that term loosely of course, biolo biology's design of actuation and sensing architectures. So here is a <coughs> diagram of some kind of fly and uh, <coughs> they have ocelli, which are sensing polarization patterns in the, in the light. They have uh, steering muscles in the wings. Some of these animals have these halteers, which are uh, controlling uh, and counterbalancing and sensing uh <coughs> for coleoris forces, um, and so on. And <coughs> And what's very interesting, of course, to all of us uh, in, in, intrigued with uh, biological flight is how few neurons and interneurons there are connecting the sensors to the effectors. So this is an animal that somehow gets to fly autonomously and expertly without a Kalman filter, for example. <laughs> uh, motivating observations that, we've, uh, that we, we make are that the sensors are noisy, they're redundant, they're distributed in non-orthogonal coordinates. And uh, it's uh, one hypothesis that I'll come to in a moment is that these coordinates are something like modal coordinates. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. The, input, the in input sensory inputs fuse across modalities. I'm going to show you a very surprising example of that in just a minute where you wouldn't ever imagine it. I don't think. <coughs> and uh, there are no con conventional distinctions here between, uh, you know, the control theorists' uh, ideas of estimate and control of inner and outer loop. The inner and uh, outer loop control for insects, anyway, seems to demand or depend on the same intrinsic systems. <coughs> and of course, there are radical differences in bandwidth, temporal response, and so on <coughs> between one kind of sensing and another vision is slow, usually, uh, compared to mechanoreception by, uh, by uh, significant amounts. So here are some of the uh, grantees, and some of them are uh, paired up so that um, 
uh, well, I didn't have room to list everyone here, but uh, my, my general plan for uh, these kinds of grants <coughs> is to pair a biologist with a mathematician or, or a control theorist of some kind uh, so that we get uh, a synergy between them. <coughs> the little red triangles represent uh, the bio-navigation funding initiative. And uh, so you see everything from, uh, uh, <coughs> well, let's see, la last year I talked about uh, uh, modeling formation flight control. I'm not going to talk about this this time. Uh, you probably heard earlier <coughs> about uh, the uh, raptor pursuit strategies in 3D over in, at Oxford and so on. Um, I will tell you, and, and last time I did discuss the dragonfly uh, interception strategy and how it depended upon uh, a very simple uh, visual neural process. Um, this is a slide taken straight out of uh, last year's program review, and I apologize for it, but not really, because I want to uh, just emphasize that we are in involved in inter international coordination with the uh, UK, and uh, these pi pictures around the, the edge are, are 6-1 scientists who are involved in this as well as, <coughs> as others. Uh, a year later, we had a, uh, a, a second state-of-the-art review um, on uh, what is the biological uh, science we need for micro-air vehicles. <coughs> uh, that was at Chilworth Manor in, in the UK. <coughs> and last, uh, last month, there was a third um, meeting among the principals at uh, Eglin Air Force Base. <coughs> so this continues. That's why I have the slide to show you that it, it's, it's ongoing. It wasn't a one-time one only thing. <coughs> Here we have some, uh, uh, some of our participants in our program. <laughs> um, not all of them, but you see that there are some vertebrates and there's some invertebrates. And uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the hawk moth today and about, uh, well, not the echolocation parts of bats, but something else. And um, some of these other animals have been featured in previous reviews. So here's a, here's a surprising. <coughs> this is a, this is work by Dr. Sanjay Sane at uh, the Tata Institute in Bangalore, India. And uh, what he discovered is how the antenna position is uh, <coughs> of a of a hawk moth is. Uh, governed and sensed by these Bohm's bristles at the pedestal. One, one thing he's, he's found, though, is that the ant antennal nervous system integrates mechanosensory inputs, that is, the antenna movements, <coughs> with photoreceptor inputs. You would never, never uh, predict that, I think, until you saw the discovery. So he's worked on how these antenna are required for flight stabilization maneuvers and He's worked out some of the control, uh, control loop. It's a very fast sensory latency of 15 milliseconds. Um, here's a new effort that we're starting at the University of Washington with Dr. Tom Daniel and Christy Morganson. Uh, again, a pair of biologists and mathematicians or aer aeronautical engineering. And this has just started, but this shows you <coughs> that um, the, the idea is here that wings not only drive flight, but they also de detect inertial moments. And, and so we, we're, st we're asking, what about these um, campaniform uh, receptors in the wings? Can we locate where they are? Can we stimulate them? Can we record from them? And find out <coughs> what they do <coughs> to modulate the wing shape and position and, and the, the muscular control of the wings. <coughs> so this had just started. Uh, the uh, three of these gentlemen that I had on the earlier slide <coughs> have combined to propose a mode sensing hypothesis for biological flight in general, um, <coughs> mostly in, uh, for, for insect flight. And the theory, as I've restated it here, is that biological sensors and actuators compose a suite of matched filters and that they're tuned to patterns or modes of self-motion and organized combined 
multiple inputs into actuation signals encoded in these modal coordinates. <coughs> so this has gotten a lot of press. Well, it's published now. And, uh, and so the, the, the challenge I've put to them is, can you now test this theory in neurobiology and in flight behavior? So they're starting to work on this. And uh, they've been working on it. <coughs> and one of, the, one of the areas in which they can make uh, quick progress, I think, is in the, uh, the visual system of these animals, <coughs> which is, has been better studied than some of the other sensory uh, avenues. <coughs> so uh, here we have a compound eye uh, on some uh, fly, Colifera vicina, and uh, we have three horizontal cells, neurons, and ten vi uh, vertical cell Neuro, ver, ver, vertical system neurons in, in the lobular plate tangential cell system of the compound eye. So that makes, what, 13 neurons altogether. <coughs> there are one or two neurons that uh, go from one eye to the other. <coughs> but most of the self-motion is uh, determined, determined by uh, <coughs> these 13 neurons, and they're tuned or matched to uh, certain directions of, of motion. So the sensory integration begins by selectively emerging these inputs and uh, the resulting matched filters, uh, we think, are, are what uh, <coughs> the animal relies on. And these t tend to be very robust and innate. But then if you uh, bring in other kinds of uh, sensory information, like the polarization sensors, which have di distinct directional sensitivity, uh, <coughs> or the neck muscles, neurons, uh, then you have the problem of how, do, how does this all integrate. And so <coughs> uh, we are at the uh, stage of starting to build theory. You know, this, this entire area is brand new. So almost anything <laughs> that I ever put up on the slide here is the, is the first idea about how these things work. And the theory in this case is that the, is that the short latency, fast acting mechanosensors first detect body rotation and then feed forward to induce compensatory head roll via the next motor system and that the long latency visual system acts on residual optic flow that's left over from that. <coughs> um, and so on. Uh, so there have been, uh, there's behavioral data that seems preliminarily to fit this kind of model. But I, I, I don't present this as a, <coughs> as a final word on any of it, but just to show you the direction it's taking. Now a new program initiative uh, that we have is uh, to uh, work on the wings of uh, animals, in this case bats, uh, uh, to, to in investigate how they activate their own wings. And, and bats <coughs> have an enormous number of joints to work with compared with birds and insects. Uh, so the questions are, uh, how is this joint coordination timing uh, controlled? Is there a redundancy, functional redundancy? Um, do they control force or position? The hypothesis is they control force. And then what do these intrinsic muscles do? These are muscles that aren't uh, attached to any uh, <coughs> joints whatsoever. And the pre preliminary data shown here is that they are active. The intrinsic muscles are active only on the wing upstroke. Um <coughs> so um, this is a work that um, uh, uh, Doug Smith and I, and I have uh, kind of jointly uh, 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 encouraged, and so Doug Smith is actually the uh, the Miri owner uh, of this kind of uh, this particular work. Um, so my time is running out quickly here, so I'll go to a summary. Uh, this summary actually uh, 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 concerned my entire program because I didn't talk at all about hearing protection, but we've had massive improvements in high noise attenuation for hearing protection that I've talked about in the past. <coughs> and uh, it's kind of organized historically, so that's in the past, but down here at the bottom of the screen, autonomous flight control 
uh, we're looking for uh, ways of biologically understanding uh, the systems that uh, <coughs> morph wings and enable biological flight to, to work. So uh, with that, I will end. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> OK, ready for questions? Um, just hello, uh, Willer. First of all, I, I'm really glad that you recognized human beings as part of the uh, transitions, uh, <laughs> showing the people you funded went to the labs. I think that's a, a really good thing to recognize. Um, had a question uh, with both you and and Tom mentioning a resurgence of interest and permission to do work in human physiology. Do you see a coming back of any of the chronobiology work from prior years that seems so <laughs> so directed to the Air Force needs? <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> no, I, well, uh, uh, lots of people ask this question. We had a crackerjack chrono, chronobiology program. We solved a lot of problems, and we had an enormous impact on, on Air Force operational work. Um, it was yanked, as everyone in this room probably knows, um, <coughs> basically from under us. Uh, because it was uh, deemed to be an intrusion on the territory of the Surgeon General. Uh, it, has, it has this kind of bio, biomedical flavor <coughs> to it a little bit. But uh, I have man managed to continue a few mathematical modeling uh, projects that are terrific, that I haven't talked about here, um, because we're in a math directorate. And so mathematical modeling of, say, the kernel bio biological system is still important and there's been some there's been some uh, <coughs> very nice work that's come out of that uh, but uh, I, I'm about to retire <coughs> uh, I'm going to retire this summer and before I leave the stage here I, I want to shout out to my former director dr. Genevieve Haddad who twisted my arm I don't know if she's here but she's maybe listening. Uh, she twisted my arm to come over to the Air Force uh, 12 years ago. And uh, it's been a marvelous experience. Uh, this is a, a wonderful, magnificent scientific team. It's been, um, it's gonna be hard to leave. But uh, I leave the, the uh, <coughs> I leave the chronobiology question to my successors. <laughs> so Willard, I had two quick uh, questions. One is on the uh, pointillistic uh, acoustic processing. It looked like the formants were swe sweeping down, but your, your sparse representation was sweeping up. I'm, it's hard for me to understand how it was intelligible speech. Was there something not shown in that plot phase or some other dimension? Well, that was, a, that was a picture of one particular word. I think it was the word shoes. Um, and you're, this is Tom McKenna asking this question. He's my neighbor upstairs in O&R. He knows a lot about uh, reading uh, spectrograms. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so I don't know how to answer the question except to say that uh, there's pitch tracking going on in each one of these uh, uh, 16 streams in that case. And, um <coughs> I, I've listened to this, and it's absolutely amazing that, that it sounds like speech. But then you can take it apart in this kind of digital way, which is beautiful. So I, I can't really answer the so, details. So the second question was this mode sensing hypothesis that your people are pursuing uh, is promising. And, and independently, uh, Pramod Bandiapati at one of the Navy labs has come up with a similar hypothesis. He's pursuing for aquatic animals. Yeah. Where he sees a lot of match between like the biosonar and and their actuation capability. Right, um, I'm aware of that. I think that's in your program, and uh, and uh, I, I heard him talk about that once. 